I have to stay close to the mic because my voice is fading a little bit. Um, if you came here to hear more about fricatives, you came to the wrong place. <laughs> I'm going to try to do something different today. Um, I wanted to start by mentioning that I, uh, my research is very collaborative in, in nature. Uh, I work with many colleagues. I work with graduate students, both current and former graduate students. But there's one colleague I'd like to sing out today, and that is uh, Joan Sabrino, my colleague in more ways than one. Um, but as you'll see, she's instrumental to my research, and she is a co-author on every study uh, that I'll talk about today. So on to uh, the role of training. Um, a lot of phonetic training was originally um, inspired by the critical period hypothesis. The critical period hypothesis goes back to at least Eric Lenneberg, not as nice of a picture as Joan's picture. Um, and um, he was a psycholinguist in the 1960s and 1970s. Um, and he defined the critical period as follows. He said, this is a period of time during which the mechanisms and strategies for language learning are still accessible. And the idea is, of course, that the capacity for language is then lost if it's not activated during this critical period, which he took to be roughly up to the age of puberty. Now, it's important to remember that Lennonberg came up with the notion of a critical period for the acquisition of a first language, first language acquisition. But it's actually driven a lot more research, the critical period hypothesis, in the area of second language acquisition. So when we think about second language acquisition, we think about a critical period for second language acquisition, then we, of course, as speech scientists, have kind of translated into the notion of a foreign accent. So the idea is, is there a critical period for language acquisition, second language acquisition, beyond which we cannot pass, go through life, uh, without a foreign accent? Okay. Now, many studies have been done on that. I know uh, one of your keynote speakers here two years ago was Jim Flagey, who has been extensively documenting and researching this. And so one of the major factors in this process is the age of acquisition or the age of learning. There's done many studies on this. Here is one where he looked at Korean learners of English. These were Koreans that had uh, moved to the United States. And uh, what you see on the horizontal axis is their age of arrival in the US. What you see on the vertical axis is their mean foreign accent rating, with a rating of nine being completely unaccented English native life, and a rating of one being strongly accented. Okay, and you do of course see that as age of arrival increases, um, the accented rating uh, goes down. That is, the accent gets stronger. Uh, but you can also see that there are ages beyond the critical period for which uh, quite native-like performance is still possible. So the idea is that some learning is possible. Um, we also know from the neuroscience literature that cortical representations are shaped continuously throughout life. They don't stop past the uh, critical period, whatever that period may be. So for us, as good news, creation of new second language categories is possible. Adult learners' ability to perceive and produce non-native contrast can be changed. Okay? So this is how we end up with the notion of phonetic training. Now, an early classic in the field of phonetic training was a study by Strange and Dittman. And they tried to um, teach Japanese learners of English the RL distinction in English, which is notoriously difficult for native speakers of Japanese. They used synthetic speech. They did all kinds of paradigms. They did identification. They did discrimination. They trained their participants up for weeks. Some of them got slightly better. A lot of them never got any better. And even the ones that got better, they didn't really generalize their knowledge to new speakers, for example. Okay, So the idea of phonetic training was temporarily abandoned. It didn't seem to work until we came up with a new approach, which is known as the high variability training procedure. Okay, and that is associated with researchers like David Pizzoni at Indiana, uh, Ann Bradlow, and other colleagues. And the high variability procedure seems to be the most successful for training non-native categories. And when we talk about high variability, we talk about variability in context, phonetic context. We talk about variability in terms of speakers. So the idea is during training, you expose your trainees during to quite a bit of variability, and ultimately, the new categories will be robust. So the goal is, of course, to modify the adult perceptual system and to construct new phonetic categories. And this is when we got into the game. Uh, up to that point, um, all phonetic training studies had looked at segmental distinctions, and the vast majority of those at actually the RL distinction. And so we asked, can we extend this to the suprasegmental domain? Can we extend this to tone in our case? And our question was, can Mandarin tone contrast 
be learned by non-native speakers. And this is research that started with a dissertation by Yui Wang, uh, Michelle Spence was an undergraduate, uh, and Joan and I. Um, I don't think I have to take you through the four tones of Mandarin, but we have seen these pitch tracks uh, numerous times over the two days of the conference. Um, and so here is an experimental design that's quite standard, quite typical in training studies. That's why I show it to you briefly here. Uh, you randomly assign uh, a group of uh, uh, participants either to the train group or the control group. Um, both groups have a pre-test and a post-test phase, uh, but of course, critically, uh, only the train group has a training phase. The control group has no training in between pre-test and post-test. Okay. So, um, what does our training look like? We had um, American students uh, that were in their first semester of learning Mandarin. Um, we had stimuli produced by two male and two female native speakers. Um, of course, when you look at tone, when you look at fundamental frequency, it's important to have a range of fundamental frequencies in your training. We use monosyllabic words. Uh, we maximize phonetic variability, had different uh, vowel contexts and onsets and so on. Um, and um, uh, our procedure was to have eight training sessions over the course of about two weeks, and you were only trained pairwise on the tones. So in a given block or a given day, you would be trained on tone one versus tone two, or tone three versus tone four, okay? And on any given trial, you would hear a word containing a particular tone, and you just had to identify that these are tone one or tone two, or tone three or tone four, depending on what block you were dealing with, and you always got feedback, crucially, okay? Then following the training, and also preceding that training, um, you would get a task in which you just did tone identification. You heard of tone, you had to say which of the four tones you thought it was. Okay. So, what are our results? We're looking at correct tone identification before training, at pretest, and you see that our trainees and controls do about the same. They're not terrible at it. After all, they were in their first semester of a Mandarin class, but they're not great either. They both perform at about 68, 69% correct. Crucially, after training, at post-test, um, we find that our trainees show a remarkable improvement in their tone identification and our controls don't show any. This is actually quite a large effect, larger than what is typically found in the segmental literature on, let's say, RL uh, distinction. Um, we then also looked at it for individual tones, this improvement, and as you see, there is, of course, uh, some variation in terms of each tone, but each tone significantly improved identification of each tone as a result of training. We also did other things. We looked at whether this training generalized to new stimuli, so words you had never heard before, and new speakers, speakers that you had never encountered before. And again, as you see here, um, these are all significant differences compared to pretest, and our controls don't show any such differences. We finally did a retention. Is this a recency effect? Because we tested our participants right after training. We brought them back in again six months after training, and they're still at the same level. Uh, they did not go down in, at all. Uh, they stayed as good as they were directly after training. And as you see, our controls um, uh, did not show any change. So this is quite effective, this high variability training at the super segmental level. Now the question then is, of course, does it carry over to production? And notice that we only trained our participants on perception. They had to identify the tones. But we decided to check whether they actually got any better on production as well. Um, so we did that in two different ways. We evaluated the production in two ways. One was to have native Mandarin listeners identify these productions. So we took our trainees um, uh, and our controls pre and post uh, productions. Okay, we mix them all together on any given trial. Our native Mandarin listeners just had to say which tone they heard. Okay, um, before training, our trainees and controls um, tokens were uh, identified at about the same accuracy rate, about 55% correct. But crucially, after training, our trainees showed improvement, so their productions after training were correctly identified at a higher rate. And as you see, our controls did not show any difference. Um, we also did an acoustic way, of course, of uh, analyzing the productions. Um, we looked at the acoustic measures of our uh, trainees before and after training, and we compared those to what you can call roughly a native norm. We, uh, we collected some pitch tracks for our natives, for native speakers of Mandarin to compare them to. We also, as you see here on the bottom, did some more uh, 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 detailed acoustic measures. I'm not going to talk about those now, but let's look at their overall pitch tracks, what that looks like. 
Um, and here's an example. So here's an example of a pitch track for a tone two. This one is by a native speaker. Okay. Here is one of our trainees pre-training. Uh, and um, here is his or her, looking at the fundamental frequency, probably her, her um, attempt to do a tone two. It doesn't look anything like the native tone two, as you see. And in fact, it was judged by the listeners to be a tone four, probably because the rapid F zero drop. Then the same um, trainee, after training, produced again a tone two. Um, it looks a lot better. And in fact, it was correctly identified by our judges as a tone two. So that's the general idea. We'll compare these uh, pre- and post-training uh, curves to the so-called standard. Uh, and that's what you see here. There's four panels, one for each tone. Um, red is the native norm. Green is the curve at pre-test. Blue is the curve at post-test. And of course, what we hope to find is that the blue post-test curves are closer to the native norm than the green pre-test curves. And that's what we find for each tone. And also, these more detailed acoustic uh, analyses that I mentioned also all show closer approximation to the native norm post-training and pre-training. Um, so in sum, what we find is that with a relatively simple training paradigm, we get significant improvement after training. It generalizes to new stimuli and new speakers. It is retained even down to six months down the road. Um, and it also leads to significant improvement in production, even though, again, our trainees were only trained on perception. So Mandarin tones can be learned with training. Okay. Now, a question that we often get, uh, especially from um, uh, language teachers, so these are Chinese teachers in our American classrooms, they say, well, why do you do this study with monosyllables? Well, first of all, because we had no idea what we were getting ourselves into at the time, but it also uh, was a little bit easier to control. Um, do you realize that monosyllables only make up about 11% of the Mandarin lexicon? Uh, we do now. Um, so we recently changed this, and this is a dissertation by In uh, Li at KU, and also a book chapter by In Jen Li Go Only, who's here in the audience, and, and Joe Serino. And so very briefly to talk about that, you can see here that we had a group of participants. Whoa, that's good. <laughs> okay, we had a group of participants that um, received a training on monosyllables, and we had a group of participants that received training on disyllables. They were, were tested on monosyllables or disyllables. Okay, and what we see is that if you were trained on monosyllables and then you were tested on monosyllables, you get a, 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 a significant improvement. If you were trained on monosyllables and were tested on disyllables, you get a smaller but significant improvement. If you were trained on disyllables and you were then tested on monosyllables, you get an improvement. And finally, if you're trained on disyllables and you're tested on disyllables, you get the biggest improvement. We show improvement across the board, but we actually get greater improvement after disyllabic training than after monosyllabic training. Okay, then we look at cortical representation of tone. So we find this behavioral improvement in tone identification. And the question then is, can we find any correlates of that at the cortical level? So we looked at brain imaging to look at changes in cortical activation before and after training. This was really a fortunate uh, confluence of events where we were able to connect with uh, Joy Hirsch, a cognitive neuroscience at, uh, at Cornell at the time. Um, so basically, this time we didn't have a control group. We essentially had uh, a group of participants that uh, did Mandarin tone identification while in the scanner. Then they did a traditional training uh, program, uh, the eight sessions over two weeks, and then they were scanned again at post-test and, and we looked at their results. So we looked at um, six native speakers of American English. Um, they had to identify the Mandarin tones as usual. We looked at behavioral data, we looked at brain activation data. And what we find, and that's really reassuring for uh, anybody, any scientist, is that first of all, we replicated our basic behavioral training effect. So again, our trainees uh, uh, got better by a little bit over 20% after that uh, eight session training. Uh, but crucially, of course, we're interested in what was happening at the cortical level. And what we see here at the, in, in terms of the imaging results, uh, we have areas in red, this is the right hemisphere, you know that uh, radiologists like to mess things up, so this is right hemisphere, left hemisphere. Red is um, areas that were activated before and after training, and yellow are areas that were activated after training only. And so there's two yellow areas here. There's a yellow area here 
that is uh, and here with the red area it just got bigger so there's a larger area activation in a larger area and then there's recruitment of a new area immediately adjacent to that area so these are the two results that we find in our training here you see them on the real brain so to speak um, and um, what you see here is um, activation before training here you see activation after training you see the larger area you see also darker voxel more activation there and that is um, in uh, Wernicke's areas, basically, left hemisphere, Bobman area 42 and 22. So we do actually find evidence of cortical reorganization with learning that goes along with the behavioral improvement that we had um, noticed before. So in conclusion, in terms of acquisition, we can talk about improvement after training. We find generalization, retention. Learning can be transferred from perception to production. Um, tone can be learned by non-natives. And of course, at the cortical level, we find recruitment of new areas in terms of both location and magnitude. Okay. Um, then we ask a different question, okay, in our pursuit of training methods and, and so on. And the whole idea of, when you think about the high variability training paradigm, the whole idea is that learning sounds, learning new sounds, and adapting to native variants requires exposure to sufficient variability. Right? That's what high variability is all about. We saw this strange indictment. If you don't present enough variability, training doesn't work. So you have to expose your subjects to sufficient variability. So we turn things around in this experiment and we ask, well, can listeners actually be trained to recognize non-native speech sounds using the same methods that work for unfamiliar native sounds? Right? So when you think about our Mandarin tone training, uh, our tone stimuli were always trained by native speakers spoken by native speakers of Mandarin. They were just foreign to our learners, they had to learn them. But now we're looking actually at non-native speech sounds and see if English listeners can get better at identifying foreign accented English speech sounds. So we're going in the other direction, if you will. Okay, so we did high variability accent training with Spanish accented English. Okay, and this is a study that started as a dissertation uh, by Travis Wade uh, at KU. Um, so the idea was that um, our English participants would identify words, they would get feedback training, they would hear multiple non-native Spanish, Spanish accented English uh, tokens. So we use the infamous phonetically balanced words. Uh, this is a list of monosyllabic high frequency words. They're all quite common and they're structured such that you can take words from one list, from a second list, from a third list and they're all sort of equally um, um, balanced. We had six native Spanish speakers with a range of English proficiency, uh, and in total, our training consisted of exposing our trainees to 600 words produced by four different speakers. And then at pre-test, uh, they were tested on one speaker. At post-test, they were tested on that same speaker again, but also at, uh, uh, on a new speaker. Okay, so uh, we had 30 native English listeners with little or no exposure to Spanish or Spanish accented English. Those are actually quite easy to find in Kansas. Uh, they were randomly divided between trainees and controls. Um, and here is what a trial might look like if you're in the experiment. You hear a word, let's say, late over headphones. You're asked to type your response in the keyboard. keyboard. Um, let's say that this person made an error and thought uh, uh, the word was let. Okay, so you see what you typed in, you see the correct response below it, you hear a bell when you get it right, you hear a buzzer when you get it wrong, um, then the wrong answer disappears, the right answer stays on the screen, and you hear the word again. Okay, if you were uh, in the control group, then you did not get the feedback. Okay, um, so what do we find? What are our results? So here we have data for the controls and the trainees. You see they're quite comparable um, at, uh, at pre-test. Okay, they do uh, better at post-test on the old speaker, the speaker they had already encountered. Okay, they do worse in the new speaker. The new speaker is obviously more difficult for them. That's already all good and interesting, but the key thing is, of course, here that the, on your slide, blue and red bars are no different. There is no effect of training. The trainees don't do any better than the controls. Okay, so there's no advantage in performance on new items produced by a new or a familiar talker. Um, so what we find then is, what we have to conclude here, is that listeners cannot be trained to recognize non-native speech sounds using the same methods that work for unfamiliar native sounds. We use the high variability training paradigm, but for some reason it doesn't seem to work here for non-native productions, non-native accented speech. And presumably then, 
The reason is that an accented speaker's productions may not be a homogeneous set of learnable deviations from the standard pronunciation. There might be simply too much variability for the high variability training paradigm to work. So that was number two that we wanted to find out. Is it actually true that there is a large degree of variability in these Spanish accented English tokens? And in this case, we decided to focus on the vowels only. We found from our experiment that when our participants made errors in identification, it was almost always an error in terms of the vowels. So we said, just let's look at the vowel space. So now we're comparing variability in the native vowel space to variability in the non-native vowel space. We already had the non-native data. We had to record a number of English speakers to uh, come up with the native data. And then we measured their formants and we plotted those in a two-dimensional space, basically a vowel height by vowel backness space. Uh, we could have also used Keith's line maybe, but we still do clouds here. Um, so here are the native productions. You see height along the horizontal dimension, vowel frontness, backness on the vertical dimension, um, and these ellipses are loosely drawn in. Um, it's a fairly compact space. Um, if you compare it to the non-native uh, vowel space, that's right here. Um, so these are our Spanish accented speakers. Uh, you see more irregular shapes, you see more overlap, and you see more spread in general. <coughs> Some of the things that uh, we know about Spanish learners of English is that they have difficulty with the tense lax distinction. And you see that very clearly here. There's quite a bit of overlap between E and E, and um, there's quite a bit of overlap between U and A. So that's something that doesn't surprise us. But there's also quite a bit of overlap down here. So um, one way, there's many ways, and we tried several of them to kind of quantify this degree of variability, is to look at the standard deviations for height and for backness for each vowel. And um, we did that. And also the mean across all vowels, we find the same thing. There is a substantially larger degree of variability for the non-native vowel productions than for the native vowel productions. So what we conclude from this in general is that non-native productions demonstrate a robust increase in variability in the vowel space. Um, we find that the non-native productions involve larger irregular distributions, a greater degree of category overlap, um, and there's also, and that turns out to be important, differences in the absolute locations of the vowel categories. Okay. Um, what we then did was we introduced another training paradigm. In this case, we systematically manipulated the variability that uh, our participants were exposed to. So we asked ourselves, okay, this high variability training paradigm doesn't work for these non-native accented productions. Is it the degree of the variability itself, or is it the absolute deviation from the native produced categories? Um, so that's what we're getting into. Uh, and what we did here was we created H vowel D words, the infamous heed, hid, head, hood, and so on words. Um, we took typical vowel height and vowel backness values based on our distributions, and we then paired those with different degrees of variability um, so during training. So you could either get um, non-native or native means, okay, non-native or native vowel means, and then these could be paired with native variability, relatively little variability. They could be paired with non-native variability, which is quite a bit of variability, and they could be paired with a very small variability, kind of artificially very small variability. Okay, so this is what that looks like visually. It doesn't look that clear, maybe. It looks better here. But um, in any case, um, you see here a column of uh, distributions that are based on the native means. You see here a column of distributions that are based on the non-native means. And in every row, you see a different degree of variability, minimal variability, uh, native variability, and uh, maximal non-native variability. Okay. So what did we do? We had 72 English listeners, 12 to assign to each of these six conditions that you just saw in the previous slide. Um, and um, again, they were Kansans. Um, and um, they heard a, a word on a particular trial, and they just had to say which of eight words he'd hit, had, and so on they thought they had heard. Um, and th we continued until they had 30 or 50 consecutive responses correct, and until they had at least identified each word, i.e., each vowel, correctly once. The 30 out of 50 corresponds to a 60% accuracy rate. And if you recall, that's basically what we got in our first experiment. When we tried to train our participants, they got about 60% correct. Okay, 
Then immediately after, after training, there was a test. They got 10 tokens of each word derived uh, from either the native or the non-native mean distribution and always paired with the maximum variability, non-native variability. Okay, what does it look like? Well, there's a couple of ways uh, we can uh, look at this. One thing we can look at is just how long did it take them to reach criterion? Remember, they had to get 30 out of 50 correct. Okay, so that's uh, what we do here. So you have errors to criterion along the vertical axis. You have the level of variability, minimal, native, and non-native along the horizontal axis. And then two functions, one for the um, native as the means and one for the trainees that had been exposed to the non-native means. Now in terms of variability, there is nothing surprising, I think, because what you see is that as variability increases, the task is harder and people need more trials to reach criteria. But the surprising thing, I think, is that that's even more pronounced for the uh, uh, trainees that were exposed to the native means rather than the non-native means. So that's kind of curious because I mentioned earlier that in the non-native distributions, there's quite a bit of overlap among some of these categories. So how can it actually be easier than when participants were exposed to the native distributions? And I think the reason for that is that, if you recall, the native vowel space overall was much more compact than the non-native space. So you got a much more compact space. If you then start increasing the level of variability, you're going to get much greater confusion. So that's, I think, what's going on here. OK. Um, so what we found was that the average linear distance between each vowel and all other vowels is actually greater in the non-native mean condition. Um, so what we think is going on here, that is the extent to which something is learnable Okay, is determined by the overall predictability of a sound. And by that we simply mean the tendency of a category or of a sound to not occur in locations where it may be confused with other sounds. So it doesn't have to be the non-native production, doesn't have to be smack where the native production is, it just has to be somewhere where it doesn't overlap with much else. That seems to be more important. Okay. Um, what we also found in terms of varying these degree, the degree of variability that our trainees were exposed to, we found that that actually did not have much of an effect except for one vowel, and I think that's kind of interesting which vowel that is, was the vowel E. Only E showed a reliable effect of these different variability levels. Um, so here we look at D prime as a measure of sensitivity to individual vowels. You see that here uh, for each of the vowels in the set, and this is for when you had been exposed to native mean condition, okay? And there's only one vowel for which the different uh, degrees of variability have an effect, and that's the vowel E. And what is, the, it's, is its direction? Um, our participants are much more sensitive when they have been trained on maximal non-native variability. When we look at the participants that um, had been exposed to the non-native mean conditions, okay, again, there's only one vowel for which the different degrees of variability have an effect. It's E, but this time it goes in the other direction. Now our listeners are more sensitive when they had been exposed to minimal variability. Okay. So what does it mean? Well, for the native mean conditions, for E, we find kind of the prototypical high variability training effect. Performance was best when training involved maximal variability. Okay. But for the non-native mean conditions, performance improved only when subjects had been improved the other way around to minimal variability. Okay. So in conclusion, what we find is that this increasing variability to non-native levels does cause a problem for most individual vowels and for overall accuracy. We do not find a high variability training effect. Accent level learning was actually quite limited. Okay, but for some easily maintained distinction, like the E based on the native means, learning is possible, high variability works. But for some of the difficult distinctions, like when you were exposed to non-native means, um, you may want to start with a much more limited degree of variability. In fact, prototype training may be better than um, high variability training. Okay. Now, let's, switch, uh, uh, let's look at, come at this from another angle yet. And let's talk a little bit about uh, perception versus production training. I know that's something that many people have asked about, the relation between training and production, training and per uh, perception. How, is, how do these two interact? So we looked at that. Uh, we've looked at tone so far. We've looked at vowels so far, non-native produced vowels. This time we're going to look at consonants. 
Um, and this is work that started with a dissertation by Wendy Hurd at KU a number of years ago. And um, we, she decided to look at perception training only, production training only, and what we call combination or combo training, where our participants got both perception and production training. Um, we looked at um, this particular intervocalic consonant distinction in Spanish. So what you have here um, uh, on, the, um, on the left is the word codo with a flat, okay? In the middle you have an underlying D, but it actually turns into an interdental fricative, codo, okay? And here's the till coro, okay? Now, that turns out to be quite a difficult distinction for our uh, English learners of Spanish. So you have the flat, uh, it's a phoneme in English, it's distinct from de and re. Apologies. That was not a speech sound. <laughs> um, you have intervocalic D, which spirantizes to a fricative. Um, of course, intervocalic D for English speakers, I should say American English speakers, becomes a flap. Okay? Uh, so that means that the acquisition of the de flap contracts is quite difficult for American learners of English. And then finally we have the trill, the r, which is of course a totally new category. So in Flavian terms, that might be slightly easier to acquire. So we looked at that and the questions were, of course, can we train American uh, uh, learners of Spanish to improve their perception and their production of this three-way contrast? And also, can we systematically tease apart the contribution of perception training and production training in this process? So. We had uh, a little over 40 participants. They were randomly assigned to uh, four different conditions. Uh, they were relatively advanced in Spanish for a semester. Ten were assigned to a perceptive training group, ten to production training, ten or eleven to combination, and eleven controls. And they were trained pairwise on these different distinctions. Um, what does perception training look like? Well, in perception training, you would hear a particular word, okay, and then you would try to match it to one of two words printed on the screen in an orthographic representation. Um, you receive feedback on every trial and you participate in six training sessions over a course of about two to three weeks. What does production training look like? Well, this is the fun part for a phonetician because we first had to uh, create a little tutorial to familiarize our participants with PAP. So everybody who came out of there knew a little bit more about phonetics at the end, said, you know, this is a waveform, this is a spectrogram, look what these different sounds look like, and so on. And then, on a given trial, they would see the orthographic representation of the word, they would see the waveform, they would see the spectrogram, so this is coro, and you see very clearly, you see um, the trills here and in the spectrogram as well. Okay, uh, participants were encouraged to study these features then record themselves and compare their production to this production and they were encouraged to re-record themselves until they were happy that whatever they were producing was as close as they could possibly come to the native norm. Now a key innovation in here is that this is really pure production training. That is, our participants never had access to any native uh, sound files. Okay? So they never heard the tokens, they only saw them. And that's a little bit different from other studies in the past that have tried to look at the contribution of production. Participants could always hear the tokens. Okay. Um, and then combination training was simply a combination of the two. Uh, again, six sessions, this time then three perception training sessions and three production sessions. Okay. Um, what does this look like? Well, this is the results for perception. So does their perception improve following these different types of trainings? And the answer is yes. Um, they, perceive, they improve for everybody except the controls and the improvements are greater for people that, perceive, that receive perception and receive production training. But it varies from contrast to contrast. Okay? This is a graph from the paper which is almost incomprehensible because there are so many different comparisons there. So I'll take you through that uh, just highlighting a few. Um, what I've highlighted here is the um, flap trill um, contrast. Red is pre-training. Blue is post-training. Uh, you see that all three groups, uh, but the controls improve, and the improvement is largest for the production training group. Okay, here we look at a different contrast. This is the duh, it becomes this uh, interdental fricative. Flat contrast, uh, again, red pre-training, uh, blue post-training. In this case, there's only one group that improves slightly, and that is the perception training group. Okay. Now the main perception results overall that all th are that all three training groups improved and the controls did not. Okay. 
perception and production training, outperformed combination training, and specific contrast matter. It varied from contrast to contrast. Okay. Um, for the production results, let's look at those. And for production, so did they improve their production after training? We did a similar thing to what we did with the Mandarin tone training. We had native Spanish speakers identify pre and post training productions. Uh, this was a three-way um, paradigm where they would hear a word and then had to map it onto one of the three orthographic representations. Here are the overall results for across all contrasts. You see again that all three groups, all three training groups improve. Uh, the combination uh, training uh, uh, a bit more. Um, and if we look at specific contracts, for example, in Coro, which remember is a new category in Flavian terms, we saw quite good uh, improvement across all our training groups. So for production overall, again, all three training groups uh, improved, controls did not. Combination training outperformed perception and production training. Um, specific contrast mattered. Again, I can't show you all of those results. Question then is, does all training work? That's what this seems to suggest. Perception, production, combination, all works. The answer is yes, but it depends, of course, on the specific contrast. So if I may highlight one here, production training is improved on the perception of flat R. Perception training is improved on perception of the flat. Why is that? Well, we think there's, this is the story. If you think about American learners, they have to tell apart a flat from a from a trill. Uh, American learners only need to learn the trill as a new category and they're done. Okay? But for the other one, the distinction between the and flat, they have to do quite a bit more. They first have to acquire the fricative as the allophone of the de. Then they have to reassign flat, which they know as an allophone from English, to a nophonemic category in Spanish. And apparently um, uh, that works better in uh, perception training. So what we can hypothesize on this limited set of data, I have to admit, is that perception training may be more effective for teasing apart two allophonic variants of the same phoneme, while production training may be more effective for learning a new contrast. Okay, finally, does training transfer in both directions? Yes, first of all, all training groups were more intelligible after training, whether they had been trained on perception or production or combination. Both perception and production training transferred to opposite modalities, and both training types transfer equally well to the other modality. Okay, now in the remaining few minutes, uh, uh, I want to talk about yet another way in which we now are recently uh, beginning to use training, and that is to shift listeners' cue weighting. So it's a slightly different use of the training paradigm. Okay, and the idea is that an increase in the variance along one stimulus dimension makes that dimension less informative. If you just increase the variance, it's not unrelated to what uh, Professor Klinger was talking about earlier. It makes the dimension less informative. It has been shown for, shown, for example, by Holt and Lotto for non-speech categories. What we're doing here is we're trying this out for speech categories. Again, looking at Mandarin tone, um, as has already been talked about earlier today, there seem to be two dimensions that are important in Mandarin tone. One is pitch height, average pitch, and one is pitch direction or pitch slope. And what we know is that in general, native Mandarin listeners pay more attention to pitch direction, uh, but American learners of English pay more attention to pitch height. So the question is, if we increase the variance along the pitch height dimension, can we then make the American learners pay more attention to pitch direction dimension, which they should be doing? And this is work very much in progress. This is with uh, Quentin Chin Jen, who's right here in the audience, uh, Jed Chung, our, our colleague at KU, and Joan Serino. Um, and very quickly to take you through that, uh, and following the Halt and Lotto paradigm, during exposure phase, you're exposed to a distribution in a two-dimensional acoustic space. And then afterwards, uh, oh, and you are getting feedback. So each token you have to assign to either category A or category B, or tone A or tone B. And then afterwards, you're trained on a specific continuum to see if that exposure had an effect at all. So here, what you see is stimulus distributions different from Mandarin and American listeners. Just like what Professor Kluner was talking about earlier, we established first the J and Ds for pitch height and pitch direction so that we weren't comparing apples and oranges. Um, uh, the, the main thing to take home from here is that all the open circles is what our participants were exposed to during the exposure phase, and then the closed circles are what they were tested on. So they were tested on a, a pitch direction continuum, and they were tested on a pitch height continuum. Okay, um, these are some examples that I will skip. Um, 
what do we find? Here are Chinese listeners. Here's their categorization uh, in terms of the direction continuum. Here's their categorization in terms of the pitch height continuum. You can immediately see that the curve for direction is more categorical. And what we find is that our Chinese listeners rely more on pitch direction than on pitch height. What about our English listeners? Uh, those two show look about the same. And what we find is that the English listeners weigh pitch direction and pitch height equally. Okay? Then, of course, comes the crucial manipulation. And that is we now change the variance during trainer training. We increase the variance in pitch height. We decrease the variance in pitch direction. And what happens, our English listeners now rely less on the high Q. So we're moving in the right direction. This is still very much work in progress. So just to sum up then, in conclusion, training works. That's the, really the bottom line here. New phonetic categories can be acquired. Robust gains extend to new words and new speakers remain over time. Um, we do need to take into account, I think, the specific contrast that needs to be acquired. So what we found in our vowel study was that high variability training works best when categories are distinct. Prototype training, minimal variability, works better when categories overlap. Training benefits from perception transfer to production and vice versa. And we again need to consider the specific contrast to be acquired. And finally, um, we can of course talk about training improving perception, training improving production, and it is wonderful. We all want to get better when we learn a foreign language. Our teachers will be very glad as well, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we also are becoming more native-like in the process. Okay? And so to look at that, we look at two additional factors. We can look at brain imaging and see if the cortical representation becomes more native-like as a result of training. And we can effectively try to change the cue weighting to become more native-like as well. So I'll stop right there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Perfect timing. Uh, we have enough time that uh, the floor is.